a lot about these things. I am going to be talking about both the O2 style stuff, so the spin models on lattices, and also uh, random surfaces, which have been sort of brought up much more humbly. Uh, the kind of things that I do, the kind of questions I'm going to be asking are going to be at a much lower resolution. I wish I could be talking about GFX or anything like that. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Uh, this is joint work with Michael Eisen and Lauren Pennant and Jacob Shapiro. And since you have me and none of my other co-authors here, I sort of came into this from the random surface integer value type function stuff. So uh, I'm going to try to sneak in to basically a second talk in there on only those and sort of try to tie back to the XY model and O2 models at the end. Um, but before we start with that, uh, since I am talking about discrete models, I think I'm contractually obligated to mention the easing model at least once. So let's start there. So the easing model and what we mean by long range order. This is probably stuff you guys know, so I apologize if I'm boring you, but what's the easing model? Uh, we're going to have G, my geometric setup for the entire talk is going to be an arbitrary, to the infinite planar and by periodic graph. That is basically you have some finite cell which you tessellate infinitely. And we're going to just take lambda to be some finite subset subgraph of it. And on that subgraph, for example, this little thing here, the easing model is going to be given by just two coloring the bursts. So blue and red plus or minus one. Here is a configuration of the easing model. And the way we sort of weight, weight them is that I'm going to give a coloring a weight, which is basically how many monochromatic edges there are. That's what we call the Hamiltonian. Uh, I hope there are no physicists in the room because I lost minus signs, but I am not a physicist and don't want to screw it up. So here is a bunch of monochromatic edges. This configuration has a particular weight based on that. And then for a parameter beta, which is the inverse temperature will be positive. I just say the easy model weighs things, things according to uh, the exponent beta times the number of monochromatic edges. Pretty straightforward. Uh, this is, of course, completely, first of all, it's a ferromagnetic model. If something is blue, other things want to be blue. So we basically have positive interactions that way. And a completely symmetric model. If I just take and switch all the colors, everything stays exactly the same. So to break that second type of symmetry, I'm just going to put blue boundary conditions everywhere and change my Hamiltonian to now include the, the boundary edges. And I now have a, bit, a finite but very large box that's slightly more likely to be blue based on that kind of monotonicity. And the question that sort of comes up is, do we feel infinity? If we sit in a corner and sort of push that boundary to infinity, do we actually feel the blue boundary conditions at infinity? And the answer is me. Uh, again, classical things, literally the very first result that I think I personally learned in statistical physics that I think most people do is that the, um, the, parallel, the piled argument, excuse me, tells you that at small beta, we basically don't see order, and at large beta, we do see order. So what we see is that if beta is small, not only do we not see order, but we see exponential decay of correlation. If I ask how much more likely the origin is to be blue, oh, sorry, it's jumped. How much more likely is the origin to be blue with blue boundary conditions? It's exponentially small with the radius. But when beta is large, it's uniformly, uniformly large. That is, you feel it all the way at to infinity. And the picture we get is essentially, I, hesitate calling this white noise because it's blue and, and red, but complete decorrelation at small beta, a sea of blue with small red islands in the center or in large beta. And of course, as everyone knows, we have an interesting picture in the middle. That's the, the conformally invariant uh, beta C where we expect power law, well, we don't expect, we know power law decay, pretty great generality in this case. This is sort of the paradigmatic thing when we think of a fixed transition. When you sort of have this, you got disorder to order. This is the idea. There's a long range order phase and a disordered phase. Can you remind us of the value of BC? Uh, log of one plus square root of two. In the case of C2, in general, it depends on the sort of uh, geometry of the graph, of course. Uh, I don't remember the numerical value off the top of my head. It's between the two. <laughs> so, this is exactly what I'm not going to be talking about for the rest of the time. This kind of phase transitions is what we do not in any way say perform C when we're talking about O2 invariant models. So again, excuse the slight remedial nature of this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's define the XY model. So the geometry is the same, planar, infinite, biperiodic, lambda is a finite graph. 
But this time, instead of assigning a plus or minus one, I'm going to assign an element of S1 to each one. So a direction on S2, on S1, excuse me, a directional thing. And the Hamiltonian, the energy in this case, just going to be the cosine of the difference. So sum over all edge, the cosine of the difference, again, it is ferromagnetic things want to line up. You do not want things to line up, but of course there's, you, you sort of roll everything with respect to the upper order measure, which is the Lebesgue measure, the uniform measure on the sphere, and go from there. I'm going to write this model probabilistically in a slightly more generic form, which is I'm going to think of this essentially having a Gibbs factor on each of the edges, this G beta. And this G beta is going to be evaluated on the gradient of sigma in this spin, where basically I'm just going to say take the difference of the angles, evaluate G beta there, and go from there. G beta, I'm at this point, all I needed to do is, well, I need G beta to be positive, so everything makes sense. And I need it to be defined on S1. So if you think of it as a function of a real variable, it should be two factor. Even really nice. Okay. I mean, in this case, yes. Uh, I'm basically always going to assume even just because it makes my life easier. Uh, I can't think of a situation where I don't right now, but I don't think it's necessarily important. Um, no, I take it back. It should be even, yes. <laughs> And the same thing we say briefly before, I want to break symmetry. So I'm just going to put right boundary conditions. Gradient, you want gradient sigma? Sigma, you want sigma v. You think this is just the difference of the angles if you'd like. Oh, the gentle. Just the idea, this is the gradient. The sigma, that this is on the edges. Sigma lives on the vertices. The gradient that's on the edges. So, 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 so there's not continuous gradient. It's just discrete. Okay. Uh, not very much is going to be continuous in this talk. I am very much a discrete person, and every, the setup here is going to be discrete, almost comically so. I'm also going to discretize spin space in just a second, uh, at least on the random surface models that I talk about. So the reason I sort of brought up the easing model is just to contrast the picture, because it turns out that long range order can be ruled out a priori in this setup. And this is the very important and sort of foundational work on this thing by Bergman and Wagner, which tell which us that there is no long range order for the XY model, or in fact, any continuous space, any, any spin space that's compact and has a continuous symmetry. So, just to stick the theorem, if we take any boundary conditions and look at sigma zero, uh, I guess as a vector average, the vector in this case, and we take the limit, the limit will be zero. That is, there will not be any breaking the continuous symmetry. Oh, look, jumped ahead regardless of which boundary condition we use at all data positive. Only two dimensions. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. <laughs> this embodied voice coming in. Thank you. Uh, yes, I am very much talking about two-dimensional thing. The word planar has been, you know, I guess I should repeat it more. Everything will also be planar today. I don't, I'm not going to be talking about higher dimensions. Um, but yeah, you can do different things in higher dimensions, of course. Uh, and the Gibbs measure will be unique at all data. And just to make the point, this is not an XY statement. This is a completely, completely generic G beta under the two conditions. It's not even an S1 statement. All I need is a continuous symmetry space with, excuse me, continuous symmetry and a compact spin space. And I also need to make sure that my G beta actually respects that. Obviously, if your G beta favors a certain direction, you can break all of these things. But we're assuming that everything is well behaved that way. And that's enough. So the two by periodicity of G beta is a real value function, for example, in our case, is enough to actually establish my design. However, even though I essentially, uh, and Wagner, have already ruled out the concept of having disorder to order phase transition, this does not mean that the XY model is working. This is not a model which does not go undergo a phase transition. And this was first sort of, uh, I don't want to misstate the historiography here, but exactly where Brzezinski, Kasla, and Stalitz come in order one another, but all three names are associated with it, the so called notion of a topological or infinite order phase transition. The idea being that even though sort of the observable, the sort of the nice thing, look at the thing, send the boundary to infinity, you feel that all of that doesn't work, that does not mean that we don't see phase transitions actually occur. So let me just sort of show you the, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. <laughs> let me take another second to sort of tell you what is the actual uh, 
sort of cartoon reason as to the difference between the pyrals, the discrete thing, and the continuous thing. Um, the idea here, how does pyrals work in sort of the dumbest possible way? Like what, take a big box and sort of imagine I take a small box in the center, paint it red, paint the outside blue. I need to pay for that. There is a tension here. Making the inside minus, and the out, given the outside being plus, requires some kind of an interface to move them. And since I have a plus one and a minus one, that interface can't really, there's nothing we can do. We're going to have some kind of interface with plus one on the outside, minus one on the inside. And that interface is going to be long if we imagine that four by four box in the center is to being something macroscopic. So we really have to pay just the length of the interface. There's no way around it. Or in higher dimensions, you can imagine that it's some kind of a co-dimension one situation, but again, everything planar. However, the introduction of continuous symmetry allows us to sort of interpolate between one boundary conditions and the other. So if I want to start from right and move to left, I don't have to sort of do it in one fell swoop in one interface. I can slowly nudge and turn and sort of imagine that this is more gradual than it is in the picture. And the difference, the sort of the gradient of the, of the angle could be small. It gets, because I'm assuming even things are going to be quadratic and things actually do sum up to be much, much less painful. So uh, taking a very intelligent work and trying to reduce it to a cartoon in Barry Wagner, the idea of this spin wave construction is part of the reason why you cannot have a longer order when you introduce it to this uh, uh, symmetry. Okay. Now I'm going to jump to the BKT situation and say that we're not bored by this model. This model does have very interesting phenomenology. And uh, let me just sort of show you some things that were done uh, I stole this from Christophe Gobin and uh, Valerio Sepulveda. This is sort of a simulation of what the XY model looks at very high temperature, very low data. It's um, each of the, the uh, colors can be thought of some kind of interpolation in the S1. It's noise. Here's what it looks like at large data. Uh, on a purely qualitative picture, you can look and see this is different. This is not, there is much more structure, and even though all the colors show up, it's not a sea of blue or a sea of one of the directions with small fluctuations locally, this is different. Uh, on the left, we've got exponential decay. On the right, we don't have long range order. What we have is just power law decay. Uh, and this kind of transition is the decay through this transition. The, move, the movement in exponential decay correlations and power law decay correlations. Um, this is what I sort of... Uh, the slight confession here, which is, we're, I'm not going to be, at least on this side, proving anything new. I'm going to be proving something very old, or, and in fact, not even doing as good job as uh, what was done before me in the 80s. But an incredibly like formative and important piece of work was that of Sensor in 1981 to basically prove this fact that for beta large enough, if I look at sort of imagine right boundary conditions on a big box, things are pointing right. The amount pointing to the right does go to zero, but at least polynomially. And not only that, the exponent gets worse and worse as beta goes to infinity. Um, this incredibly, again, seminal piece of work on this kind of stuff is also, I don't know anyone here, if everyone here has tried to read it, it is a difficult piece of work. This is, there's a lot happening there, there's a lot of multi scale analysis. There's sort of, it's big guns. Uh, the thing I'm here to tell you about is a way to get maybe not quite as good of a result, but to do so much more softly and much more, you know, without sort of bringing up the big gaps. Using, not working on the XY model directly, but using some notion as well. So let me state sort of our contribution in this, for, in this case, which is for the XY model in infinite volume, at beta large enough, then I have this kind of, there is a one minus epsilon there. It's always a technical thing. Don't worry about it. Just like didn't want to write something we didn't prove. This is a sort of a susceptibility. If I look at sigma zero, sigma V, this correlation under the XY model and sum it up over all V, this is infinite with a one minus epsilon to unfortunately uh, screw up the story a lot. This is enough. I mean, 
using some sort of lead driven style style correlation equalities for the XY model. This is enough to be able to say that sigma zero sigma v, just asking the two point function. In fact, it's bounded below by the by a constant divided by the distance to the two plus epsilon. So it's enough to get power law. What it is not enough is to get better power law decay. Okay? This is just a uniform and all data. There is some kind of power law decay. I can't show that as beta goes to infinity. This uh, decay is worse than worse. But it is enough to get power law decay. Okay? And the sort of more, I don't know, more important memory sort of thing is that it's actually a more general state. We're able to sort of do this not just for the XY and for sort of models that we understand very well, but for a full class of different potentials G data. So there is a full thing, and I presented those of you who are quicker readers than me, like, and then I speak, will notice that I say that this is for G beta in the class G, which I then proceed to not find. Um, I will get there, I promise. Uh, but we do have a full class that's, I mean, that includes both the XY model and the lane model, a bunch of known models as well as. A lot of other ones where our technology sort of allows us to get these kind of BKT based transitions for a bunch of OGP functions. And what we do is again, we never work on the XY model directly. It's going to work through a dual model. A dual model. Uh, this is not the dual model that was used by uh, Post Lancer originally. They sort of went through another integer value model, which was a lot of Coulomb gas. So where it was an like inverse of kind of interaction. We're not doing that. This is a different duality to integer value random services, which is sort of where I want to go next. But before I do so, I just want to make one quick uh, mention because first of all, Dietrich was here. So you guys have already heard some of the story, but also Dietrich, Dietrich and Martin Bliss basically took a very similar approach for sort of talking about the, uh, the XY model through this dual thing. However, they sort of analyzed and sort of the duality is the same. The way they get from the behavior of the random surface to the behavior of the XY model is totally different. They went through random currents. I'm going to go through defect lines and sort of the geometry of the random surface itself. And also, I sort of want to spend some time talking about some things on the random surface side, sort of Gaussianity and semi Gaussianity and how it works there. But I don't want to, in any way, shape, or form, not give credit where credit is due. It is wonderful independent work of us and definitely needs to be mentioned before I go on. Okay. Oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, does this transition happen continuously, or still there's a fixed parameter like between exponential and the, the latter? There, there, no, there, there is there is a beta c such that when it's larger, we have the kind of monotonicity that basically, from the left of it we're exponential, from the right of it we are in fact power law. So yeah, it's a, it is it is a phase transition the way we expect it to be. Okay. Do you know that the power law holds out beta c as well? Oh, I mean. No idea. We have nothing in any way, shape, or form to get to the power. We're, there's a bunch of things here which I believe are not optimal. The question is essentially we, we have a one way thing. We're going to show the dual provision of random surface implies this. We don't have the localization implies it. Essentially. So, I, this, although it's 100% should be true. Uh, um, I don't think that the technology we have at this point is good enough to actually show it. But maybe if someone sort of gets into their uh, guts of this and does more, it's, it's a possible approach. Okay, so I talked about duality. Let's just sort of see what's the duality we're dealing with. Um, here's a graph. You can think of this as sort of a part of the biperiodic infinite graph. And I want to sort of think about, oh, I've got the O2 invariant model on it. And I want to think for a second about its partition function. This is going to be a duality on the level of partition functions to start with. We'll talk about the question of whether we can actually couple or at least pass more interesting information back to the duality later. But let's just sort of talk as to what is this that we're talking about? How do we get your value of random surfaces to your model? So I've got a bunch of things being multiplied over edges. Here's an edge. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to, because that uh, G beta is 2 pi periodic, I'm going to write it as a, as a Fourier series. Oh, Lord, that jumped more slides than I wanted. Yes. I'm going to write it as a Fourier series because I can. 
You can't stop. In what can surprise pretty much no one who has sort of played these kind of games before, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shuffle the order of summation. So while here I'm sort of integrating over vertices, then summing over edges with these integers, I'm going to essentially assign a priori each edge one of the integers, move that on the outside, and sort of resum over the vertices. And if you do that, what you end up seeing is that we're going to sum over the edges, sum of, multiply over the sum of the integers, sum over the edges, and then multiply over the sum of the KUVs over all neighbors of a particular vertex and integrate that. And when I look at that and I think basic sort of harmonic analysis, I say, hey, I've got all these edges around this particular point. And if they don't sum up to zero, nothing is going to actually be distributed. And then I say, hey, I've played duality games before and I see a star like this. What does this mean on the dual graph? So if I move to the dual graph and say, I have to think this is a divergence free condition. And it means that these KUVs, these integers, must be the gradient of of an integer value. Well, the gradients are integers, and you can choose the height themselves of the integers as well by sort of setting them this code. And then once I have that function h, I can just sort of go through the integral sums up to whatever it needs to be. And what I'm seeing is that I can, instead of like taking this O2 thing, I can just choose an assignment for every vertex in the dual graph, so every face, a height. And the interaction between the highest length and the gradient, when the function, the sort of interaction is going to be g beta hat, the coefficients of the Fourier scale. All of that's to say, I've got a partition function of an integer value rounded surface. So this is going to be my opportunity to sort of take a moment and once again talk a little bit about these kind of random surface models that we're talking that I'm interested in in total sort of generality g star is my infinite biperiodic plaid graph and i'm going to sort of define this based on a potential lambda oh keep jumping i'm sorry what is this yeah where i'm just convincing i'm saying that my probability is proportional to a potential u lambda of the gradient of x the very very important thing here is this. I am restricting things to be integers. That is both a great thing, means all this, I don't have to deal with integrals, which is lovely for me to have stare at continuous things. But more importantly, it really does change the behavior thing because we can't really make small, you know, we have a minimum step size. That sort of fundamentally changes a lot of the dependence that we're doing. Now, you lambda, I'm going to assume is all concave, and that's going to be really, really important and very restrictive. Uh, one of the sort of very, very interesting things in random surfaces is things, for example, where I take an integer value of random surface and say that all the differences are plus or minus one, which is the six vertex model, if you have a high part graph, or plus or minus one is zero. None of that thing would be. Well, that is often great, actually. So, but that's not going to be included for other reasons. You can have sort of the situation where it is just plus or minus one is not included because it's zero value is for, is, is for it. Um, so lock and cavity is going to be a very, very important integral condition that we have. Um, as I mentioned before, the Gaussian case is going to be my sort of workhorse, the thing that I sort of, I'm going to focus on uh, very strongly. But there's sort of two other examples I want you guys to keep in the back of your head. Oh, sorry, ZGF, Z for uh, Gauss, the integer value Gaussian field. The other two examples I want you to keep is the idea of the stretch expansion. So instead of just x to the alpha over alpha, where alpha is either smaller than two and larger than or equal to one, I definitely don't want to make it smaller than one log cavity will fall. Larger than two is going to be a slightly more interesting question, which we'll get, I'll get to in a second. The other really obvious example that I want you to consider is the case of I evaluated the difference of lambda, where this is the modified decimal function. Obviously, this is a completely ridiculous example, but it's very important because uh, it actually ends up being the, the correct thing to do when we talk about the XY model. So this is just there because unfortunately, the Gaussian example, which is sort of the one that we want to work with, isn't the one that I actually told you about that, that it's most easily motivated when it comes to the O2 side. 
And so we have to think about these kind of much nastier functions if we want to actually be able to answer questions. The, the Gaussian is the delay. So this is the part where I have to humble myself based on what was done by Shimon uh, earlier. I am not going to ask about fluctuations. I'm not going to ask about any of these things. I'm just going to ask, hey, is this going to infinity or not? If I just take this model, put zero boundary conditions at n, and send n to infinity, what's the variance doing? Is it actually bounded? You can only bound it if you call localized, or does it go to infinity if you call it localized? And the sort of cartoons of this is that the localized surfaces are essentially the, the Gaussian free fields. This is the kind of thing where what we expect is delocalization is some of the first piece of evidence for convergence to, to, to the convergence of an appropriately scaled thing. There's actually a very interesting paper uh, on that, that was put on the archive on Tuesday by Chris Lammers, which I think sort of goes in this direction. I haven't had the chance to read it carefully, but looking at it, I think the idea that this is somehow possibly sufficient to actually move in that direction is something that would be really, really interesting and it seems to be going that direction. The localized surface, of course, this is sort of my cartoon. Essentially, it's flat with small local fluctuations. Maybe you sort of are high, maybe low, but it's essentially just flat. It's zero with small local fluctuations. Um, the fact that I'm able to tell you these two stories is a completely and utterly dependent on the fact that this is an integer value of uh, It's a, essentially an uh, exercise you can give a master's class to say that the, if I were to do the exact same thing, but with a real value, Point through here, regardless of the value of lambda, mostly just a scale free situation. You just basically scale out your lambda, and you only have to do it at one point, and then just computation between assumptions because everything is Gaussian continuous and happy with the result of Gaussian conditions right there. The reason that we sort of can even see a localized thing is exactly the fact that there is a single step size that's fixed on the form. If I make a lambda incredibly large, just making a step by one is so prohibitively expensive that you can do kind of um, like these very brutal bounds are enough to actually show localization. The opposite side is a lot harder. Uh, proving things that that small end of things delocalize it tends to be the difficult thing. This is uh, in many ways a very unfortunate fact because the low lambda and the high beta phases are exactly the ones that you do. So you can't use the duality between the XY model and let's say the modified vessel field to say, oh, the modified vessel field is, 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 is uh, delocalized because the BKT phase and the localized phase match. That's in fact, to give the spoiler, essentially the theorem that we proved. So to show that delocalization of the appropriate surface implies the BKT. So let me just sort of make that a tiny bit more explicit. What are the duality relations? So if I said u lambda, this is what Tom said, if u lambda is the Gaussian thing, the G beta that's associated with it is not the XY model, it's the delay model. So one over two lambda, and then you sort of look at all the translates and square that. And to get the XY model, you do need this weird uh, best modified Bessel function thing. And the what we call the ZSEF, the integer valued stretch exponential field, has some kind of dual. It's explicit, it makes sense, everything is positive, everything is like that. You, you, you don't worry about it. There is an entire class for all these alphas that actually make sense. And the important thing is that there's an inversion of parameters. Low lambda here large parameter here, and vice versa, high beta, low parameter. So the phases that are of interest, the exponential decay, the easy one for xy, and the localization, the easy one for the integer value fields, match. So uh, unfortunately, that part's not done for us. We can't really uh, move in that direction. Now, the when working with integer value fields in general, the thing you need is usually something to hold on to. You need some kind of way to, sort of, to decouple things, to decorrelate, to do something with them. And 
Usually that's going to be some kind of a feature. Some kind of a way to say these things like you, you know about one thing and you know that other things are smaller than it by some kind of a standard. Uh, what I want to sort of talk to you guys about here is a very it's a different way to sort of talk about multiplicity that comes from an unexpected direction of theoretical computer science. This was uh, um, I believe the world's at least my favorite instance of googling something that something expected. Uh, and let me just sort of tell you a little bit about it. This is, goes under the name of lattice model. Um, this is a, a, the name that was used by uh, the Legger and, and Noah Stevens of which were two computers, uh, theoretical computer scientists that sort of did this from the community of uh, theoretical computer science. This is unfortunately a different notice, notice, notion of lattice, excuse me, than the one we're used to in terms of ZD. A lattice in this case is taking ZD and applying any linear map intelligence. So it's just some kind of you know discrete thing. And what we basically do is they look at Gaussian measures on lattices. That's the thing that interests them for a completely different set of reasons. So given a lattice and a positive, a positive definite matrix A, I'm going to define to sample a point on that lattice by the law that psi in whatever the space it is, its probability is e to the minus one half psi a psi divided by the fraction. This is a Gaussian measure. If I make the particular decision of basically making psi be the vector of heights and make A be the graph of Hashim or the negative graph of Hashim and L just be the identity, then I am sampling nothing more and nothing less. This is a sample, simple integration by parts. Make H Laplace negative Laplace and HD gradient H squared move to the other side. This is nothing more than the DG. So this is great. Cool. Just I mean it's apologies at this point. There's nothing particularly interesting here. The remarkable thing is what happens next. What they have proven is if I now consider two different lattices. One that is not larger in the sense of larger in the sense of inclusion. That is, every point in one in the lattice L is a sub is a point of lattice L prime. Then the moment generated function of psi in every direction are real. I am still honestly trying to figure out what uh, what what we can build out of this in quality. There is a lot happening here. To speak very very briefly, this is essentially unique quality. There is enough here to say that basically, if I look at, let's say, coupling constants, if I increase coupling constants, uh, variances decrease. It's also enough to say that, you know, if I make a lot of bigger, the variance of the height decreases. This is sort of the thing that we're going to make the most use of right now. So, decreasing the lattice in this sense decreases variance. But the thing is, is that this lattice inclusion can do a lot of things that we don't are we are not used, used to do instead of the statistical physics world. And the way that I'm going to use it, at least for now, and this is just one thing. Another thing that this can be used, by the way, is to prove existence of uh, infinite following uh, gradient, dip, gradient dip centers with not a single mention of the word of the letters F, A, or D. Which I think we sort of noticed relatively late in this process that we sort of can actually say that just like look at the gradient, and expanding the graph can be thought of as, as sort of making the lattice larger. So the kind of multiplicity you get from this is just enough to sort of be able to take limits and not have, not have to worry about subsequences and things like this. There's a lot of uses for this. I'm going to use it for surgery. I'm going to use it to talk about geometry of my graph. So, oh, sorry. One of the things it allows me to do is do the standard Gini gradient quality thing, which is take a graph and say, hey, you know these two vertices? Let's smush them together. Take a capital constant of zero and turn it to infinity. Whatever that does, it's going to shrink all the vertices. And then once I shrink this thing, I can sort of put a vertex there in the center at the cost of doubling the, the coupling constant. So the very straightforward thing this can do is just allow you to excuse me, couple to increase the sum. Another thing we can use it for. 
is to add vertices. So to take an edge and add a vertex. This one's tricky. This one also, as I mentioned before, Rebecca Fass, thinking the bigger all size complexity is an inherently Gaussian thing. This is questions about the Gaussian interaction map. So it's a ZGF. And we're going to leverage that in a second because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that if I take these two things and I put a vertex in the middle here, and allow this to be a fully real thing, and then just put a real Gaussian here and a real Gaussian here to lambda. This is just a standard Gaussian thing. Right? You have e to the minus x squared, you can put a vertex in the middle, integrate it over, everything is fine. The remarkable thing is that we are allowed to replace this vertex by an integer value vertex, and only lose, only lose variance. Why? Because I can just think of this as being to the minus k times that. So take a kind of very, very thin thing. And the more k you've got larger, the lattice gets finer and finer. So this is, you can sort of imagine starting it here and sort of increasing k. Every time I increase k, my variance goes up. This is a monotonic sequence. And so sort of all the sort of pathological things that measure theory to just can happen don't happen in this monotonic. So when you sort of go through this process, you can sort of imagine going here. And at the end of the limit, you're going to go up. So every time you sort of refine this thing, you can actually get to the procedure. Oh, Lord Almighty. Where you can actually, just by doubling the constant, put an integer value. This is sort of uh, where that alpha solid two condition comes in. Maybe it's because I was naive and I sort of started thinking about these numerical properties. But things like this, for example, seem totally trivial. But if let's say you have, uh, this is an old example of uh, Lee Blagovich and Redstone, I think, if I'm not, I hope that, that uh, reference is correct. But if you have x to the fourth interactions, that is not Gaussian, but x to the fourth interaction, there are situations where identifying vertices, in fact, increases like this. And here, if you just add a vertex in the middle and don't actually do this double and instead of compensate for it, Variance can explode very, very quickly. So there is sort of this is much more fragile than it looks to sort of a person when we first started trying to do this and trying to play with the geometry. There's a lot of, of pitfalls essentially. There's a lot of hidden mind. There's it's a minefield to sort of do this surgery without changing the variance. And the sublattice monotonicity is really the thing that allows us to make this work without any fault. And one thing that it allows us to do, and just sort of as a particular example, is that I can take sort of the random surface on Z2 and turn it into a random surface on the hexagonal lattice. So here's a piece of my Z2. I know that I can put a vertex everywhere in the middle and the coupling constants are off by a factor of two. And then what I can do is I can take all these diagonals and squish them together, identify those vertices that's still perfectly kosher. And the resulting geometry I get is the slightly weirdly skewed cycle lattice. So squish everything like that. There is a bit of a question on how the coupling constants are done. Uh, if you do it more the way I did it, it will be a four lambda, two lambda. If you are slightly more careful, you can just get three lambda every time. But again, we also have a we have a Geneva problem where you can just bump up the, the coupling constants and only lose variance. So what this procedure allows us to do is to actually change the geometry from an arbitrary by, uh, by periodic pentagram to one where all the degrees are most important. And the reason this is very important is because of a, of a beautiful result of Pete Labbers from, I guess, a year ago now, which tells us essentially that random surface, that these kind of integer value random surfaces, if the potential is not conveyed, and we have this one condition on U1 versus U0, it's large enough. You can think of this as somehow dropping on this small map. Things need look like, essentially. Um, this geometric maximal degrees three condition is essential for his argument. Uh, I can confidently say this. I've spoken to him and we've thought about this a lot. There is 
no conceivable way, because this is a very soft about argument that sort of depends on the fact that in degree three graphs, basically, you can't have two paths from the point. You take that away, this entire argument comes. So we spend a lot of time sort of thinking and thinking about this, and the fact that we're allowed to do to make statements of general geometry is based on the fact that we can do this reduction using some nice model. So basically, I just wanted to advertise this thing, which I think is very cool. <laughs> but uh, it is sort of a new tool to sort of to think about how to deal with the base geometry. And sort of basically, if you don't mind losing some constants, it really allows you to sort of only think of a single plane of your base, base geometry and not have to worry about sort of a lot of the vagaries of the lattice and the geometric. The other thing that's remarkable about this is that it turns out, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, um, that this in fact doesn't need gauge down, at least not straight. It turns out that all of the, every single statement I've made about sublattice monotonicity, if I replace the ZGF with a Z valued UF for UF general potential, I can say a lot of it if U does one thing one thing. That's a sort of mixture of Gaussian. So if I can write u as an integral of Gaussians over some measure of the, of the couplet t, which by the way includes the, the vessel, includes the stretch exponentials, and includes pretty a very, very large family. Instead of you know, just things that can be written as integral of Gaussians, and if you think of this in terms of, excuse me, sort of Bachner's theorem and harmonic analysis, this is some kind of things where like, you know, the harmonic dual is the positive and makes sense and lock in lock and favorite second. It's sort of hard to characterize this in any coherent way, but this is a very large factor. It turns out that basically everything I've said about the log mount the, the logic monotonicity generalizes to those to these kind of potentials. And to speak very briefly about what's going on here, this is essentially a quite random sorry. What we do is essentially imagine that it's each of the lambda instead of being fixed, it's an independent random variable sample according to the equation. And if the, the full on partition function can be written as just integrating that with the appropriate points. To actually get the monotonicity to, to, to move through, we need to do a bit more sweat. Like there's some, there's uh, essentially an FPG argument that I want to say we stole from a uh, paper of Chase. Uh, but it's it's it is work. It is the idea of somehow how you wait and sort of how you actually couple things together when you do the doubling of the system that leads us to the Gini grade equality that's essentially in that uh, exponential moment generating inequality of things. Things pass through. And that to me is remarkable because the, the fact that sort of how much Gaussianity was sort of built into that argument is shocking to me that somehow we managed to pass it through. To a quench system. Uh, the other thing that this does, by the way, as far as I know, for most of these potential Gini grade qualities, we're not, we're not meant to be yes. So, monotonicity, coupling constants, and things like this for integer value uh, random surfaces with potentials U, which are mixtures of Gaussians, I believe that's a new result. I haven't found it in the literature yet and haven't managed to do it by sort of the standard Gini grade kind of thing. And it just the flexibility of the lattice is uh, set up is really quite nice. And when we combine that with uh, Pete Lambert's result, we can now say that basically for any biperiodic graph, any U lambda that is a mixture of Gaussian and is log concave, we have a delo constant. Which again, in this figure, I don't think as far as I know, is in this Although it does lean on, it very much leans on Pete's result, which is even more significantly more difficult. And this finally allows me to explain to you what I meant by some kind by, by that class G of potentials. So if I have my Gibbs factor G beta, if it's Fourier dual G hat beta is such that it's log concave convex uh, uh, log concave mixture of Gaussian, then for large enough values of beta, we have a And what this statement here is really hiding is the fact, the sort of the final thing I want to tell you about, 
the fact that oh, no, right? I mean, that's, well, okay, I'm sorry, I took a bit longer than I realized. Um, the statement here is a statement that's been missing, which is delocalization to do a model implies the decay. Uh, I'm going to try to do this uh, without completely uh, speaking at my normal speed. So, as I mentioned before, the idea here is that what we're going to do is we're going to look at the geometry of the random surface directly. And the way we're going to look at it is look at the level. So, given a half integer, I can sort of say that every single guy is going to be smaller than or larger than a half integer. So for any for any half integer, I can sort of consider the set of loops to the left of which things are larger, to the right of which things are smaller. So if I have this particular random surface, here is the negative one half surface. Just it's going to be there could theoretically be by infinite paths, but if you do it on a finite graph and with zeros on the boundary, I just have directed paths, which I mean, some of these are going to have meeting points like that, just resolve it in one particular way that's set a priori to get non intersecting nested cycles. Um, I'll note that different cues could intersect because my jumps aren't necessarily one. You can have the same edge have getting different colors. If you look, let's say, at three halves and negative one half, they both use the same. Edge. So this is for different values of Q, they're different, but for any value of Q, they are distorted. And the reason we care about these is because once you sort of see these loops, it is incredibly clear what delocalization and localization means. If you localize them, look at a point and you ask, hey, how many level lights surround me? Send them to infinity, that's going to be meant. If you're delocalized, however, With probability one, for any point, there's going to be infinitely many different level lines surrounding it. The variance goes to infinity. So, as this goes in any sort of infinite following gradient gives measure, you should have infinitely many things. Of course, the answer is sort of quantitatively, if we believe the GFF uh, scaling you can do, is that it's essentially an RSW kind of thing where at any scale it exists. I'm not going to have that kind of resolution. All I say is an infinite. So what we're going to say is we're going to sum one to get a situation which tells us that that susceptibility, that sum, should be somewhat related to the number of level lines that cross that path. The way we sort of do that is we go back to the duality. And sorry, this is going a bit faster. So everybody's going to get tired. I don't want to keep everyone for another 20 minutes. Is and I'm doing wrote this for this but for the Villain, which is that the, the partition function of the Villain model can be written as the partition function of the ZGM. If I then ask to sort of multiply in a sigma zero, sigma s, a sigma x, sigma x, sigma y, and follow through this exact same argument. Oh, sorry, those are my two vertices. Uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Suppose I have on my prime on my primal graph a vertex u and a vertex v. And I want to sort of consider some kind of a path between them or I can rewrite the expectation of this as follows. So the, the denominator is still the same thing. For the numerator, I basically have the same thing, except every single edge of the dual graph. Which is orthogonal to these paths, no longer wants to be at zero. For a usual function, hx minus hy, the best possible value is hx equals hy. For these, I'm going to want it to be one instead. So essentially, I introduce a defect, which tells me that along all of these lines, there is a bump of one, that the height between these wants to be one. They don't want to be zero. And this is just uh, honestly a straightforward piece of algebra and sort of carefully keeping track of what that sigma u sigma uh, x is in terms of the polar trend. Let me define an event. Got these vector vertices e and u, u and v, excuse me. And I want there to be a level line between u and v 
counterclockwise just for the for the convention to work. So it starts at U, goes to V, and misses my defect. Here's an example. Remember, level lines are on the primal path because my heights are on the dual path. So this is the thing that separates these kind of things. Let's say here I have, let's say, larger than, than one half, here I have smaller than one half, going all the way around. It's an event you can't stop me. The claim is, is that the expected value under the delay of this thing is bounded below by probability of this thing. And why is that? Look at what's the What we see here is our close curve, where we know this is larger than half, this is smaller than half. And here I have a jump of one. Formally, when an event occurs, I need to be careful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an exploration of this level to make sure so to see what it is that I can actually do to find the level. So I'm going to just do an exploration. Everything here is going to be larger than half, everything is going to be smaller than half here, and going all the way around as well. I now know this thing, and I only reveal the faces here and the faces on the outside. The difference here is at least one, the difference here wants to be at least one. It is incredibly straightforward to me at least to say, hey, let's just take everything here and subtract one. That makes things better. I have a tension of one, which I now sort of it's supposed to be in here. I had a gradient that I will no longer have a gradient. So basically, if I have a thing that wants a bump and a level line that already has a bump together, they sort of work the same way. And if I just erase it, I increase my partition function. For me, this is a nightmare. <laughs> actually, because of sort of the integer value nature of this, actually getting a proof and sort of understanding what we call some positivity of attention modulus, which is essentially if you unstep, if you unstretch the string, things get better. Shockingly difficult. Uh, that was two months of my life. But the, the intuition is right there. And then once this event occurs, the, the ratio of these two partition functions is in fact large. So again, just to show you this pictorially, all of these want to be one. So what I can do is, is just sort of reduce everything by one. And then I, instead of having the defect there, I reduce it by one. It's now essentially the standard partition function. Cartoon enough. What does that tell me? If I want to know sigma u sigma v, I can just ask, hey, is there a level line between these? If there's a level line, that is a PD small. Here's my cartoon of what the level lines look like. There. Terrible, very, very nasty geometry. But I take this point and I look at the green level. There's the first point that hits this the x axis and the first point that hits the y axis. These two points have correlation to this point. Probability. Same with these two. Same with these two. Same with these two. Basically, if I just sum up over the x and y, the positive part of the x and the positive part of y, the correlation with these two. That has to go to infinity because there's going to be too many arguments. And then I apologize for those of you, but I do want to wrap it up. The idea is that each level line gets us a sigma u sigma v to be at least one. And if we sum it up over all things, what we see is somehow a quarter of its susceptibility from here to here. And then of course we can always translate this one to the origin. You can imagine this is nothing more than some sorry, sigma u sigma v when v is in the second quadrant. So that's already the difference. There are the reason for the fact that I sort of read the one right steps on because these are not actually disjoint. So we might be double counting, triple counting, or triple counting. But if you just have good enough control to say that the probability that they, that they overlap has good enough tails by a standard sort of holder and copy kind of thing, we can actually show that even though they can overlap. Most of them don't, and this remains. Oof, I'm sorry that went a bit quickly. I sort of didn't manage my time, but that's really all I have to talk to, to say to you today. Thank you very much. Give me time for uh, something. So, how did you find this convincing? As I said, literally. <laughs>
I am not even kidding you. Uh, I was not in the room. Student inequality or something. I was not in the room, so I can't tell you what the thing was with Google. But uh, I went to dinner and came back to dinner, and one said, "Here's a thing you might want to read," and that is the extent of this situation. And it was honestly, I, I like figuring out the sort of boundaries of this method is something I'm very, very interested in. Um, for a while, we thought we had a two line proof of the numerical division. Yeah, it. Uh, it turned out to be false because it's not as strong as we thought it was. Uh, but there is sort of understanding exactly what this sum odds operation and what it means in terms of these specific models. The easy thing is to just say identify points or push boundaries outside. There's a lot of sort of freedom in it. And it's not clear to me if we reach the sort of bottom of how to push this over. So luck is the answer. And, and is the proof interesting? The proof is the proof is incredibly simple. It's double the system. It is a standard genius kind of thing. Double the system instead of move things over. It's not. It's interesting, but it's not insightful directly. It has exactly what you think. And their motivation was. There was a, there's a lot of questions of sort of um, somewhat lattice photography, where sort of essentially you give a bunch of points and ask how things come together. So basically, find, given a, a bunch of vectors that form a lattice, what's the closest point to the origin? So doing it randomly according to a Gaussian measure was apparently something they care about. Um, I'm definitely a terrible person to ask that question. Uh, I am say, telling things that were told to me. I don't truly understand it. I can't. But it's a really nice down paper. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, 